Aloha. Hello. Hey. Welcome, Mr. Ryan Gold. You are, I'm very happy to talk to you today. Thank you. Well, we're excited to talk with you as well, and uh, the students have questions for you. So you want to you want to jump okay, in here good. and start? Sure, I'll start. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us um, where you think the countercultural spirit of the whole Earth catalog and the well lives in the Internet of 2014. That's an excellent question because I think it goes to the heart of a critical uncertainty, a challenge for you and your generation um, about the, the, the future of the web. And, and I think the spirit is think for yourself and participate. Uh, you don't uh, remember the era before you were born when your only choices were really the three television networks and the one telephone company. Um, the web wasn't built by a company or by the government, it was built by millions of people. And now we've got um, Google and, and Amazon and Facebook who are, are really trying to make their, their private domains on the, on the web, and, and those are useful, I use all of them, but I think it's important for people to use WordPress, use Tumblr, use Twitter, use whatever platform is going to come along to create and connect on your own so that we have a healthy ratio of people who are creators as well as consumers of culture. I, I don't think it would be healthy for us as individuals in terms of the richness of our lives, nor would it be healthy for um, democracy or for the, the cost of online services if we, we give up this kind of user-created uh, web. And, and really the whole earth catalog People think of the counterculture of the 60s, but it really goes back to Ralph Waldo Emerson and his essay on self-reliance. That's been an American trait for a long time. Let's not trust the king to do it for us. Let's, let's do it ourselves. Let's find the tools and teach each other and do it. And, uh, and we have some fantastic tools uh, available today with the the critical uncertainty, the missing element, is whether people like you and me are going to spend parts of our day creating as well as uh, passively consuming. Chase. Cool. I was going to ask you um, in regards to like an article that you wrote in 2009 on, well, you said that you were frustrated by the superficial way most people perceive Twitter. Um, and so you wrote an article about like what was useful about Twitter. How do you feel like that was in 2009? So how do you feel that it's evolved? And do you think that um, people aren't quite as superficial about the way they perceive Twitter today? And how do you think it's evolved since then? You know, you would have to do some kind of scientific survey of the way Pew um, Internet in American Life does to really have some kind of evidence-based answer to that question. And Twitter is so big. Um, it's, you know, all over the world. And there's so many kinds of people using it that it's, it's impossible for any one person to, to really um, characterize it as, as a whole. I know that the communities that I participate in, educators and, and students like you who are interested in the kinds of questions that you're asking, who are interested in the, the intersection of technology and, and learning, have all kinds of fantastic uh, tweet chats and hashtags and relationships and communities that grow out of Twitter. And I also know that there are communities there that are, are, are wholly about entertainment. And there's a lot of nasty stuff going on. There are um, you know, prominently women being attacked um, in very, very nasty ways. So. You know, it's, I think it's a reflection of human life. The, the, there are creative people and community-minded people and nasty people in the real world, and Twitter enables them to connect with each other, magnify with each other. 
I don't really, um, I've been accused of being an optimist, which I'm, I'm not really. I think I, I know too much about what has gone on in the world and what is going on in the world to be an optimist, but I'm hopeful. We really wouldn't have the, all of the useful things that we have now um, if people had not had a hopeful point of view and, and created them. So, again, the reason I wrote my book, Net Smart, was that I think that the technology has raced ahead of the literacy about how to use it and the educational institutions have lagged behind in teaching people how to use it. So I think it, it's really up to people like you, those of you who appreciate how to use Twitter and, and get into it, um, help your friends understand how, how that works, you know, how, how you can build personal learning networks, how you can give material out to others freely and they will reciprocate and everything you put out will come back to you ten times. Um, so, the short answer is, I, you know, I, I hesitate to give you an anecdotal answer. I don't know for sure. I do see a lot of positive and a lot of negative happening on Twitter. There's talk that Twitter is changing its user interface and maybe will deprecate things that users have invented like hashtags and retweets and I think that that would be a shame if the company in its effort to try to reach more users is going to crank back on the community affordances that the users ourselves have invented. So to, to follow up on that question, we have a, a local high school that has a one-to-one -one computer initiative and when they hand out their computers, they block Facebook and Twitter on day one. So in, in terms of creating that kind of literacy and ability for even to, to manage the information overload of those um, during academic hours and the policies of, of the public education, how, how do you see the roadmap for that working? Well, from day one, what, what I don't know is what they are doing with it. Um, so many efforts to bring technology into classrooms kind of emulate the, the old, old paradigm of the, the, the teacher as the holder of knowledge and the students who are the passive consumers of that knowledge, whereas the web is really all about peer learning and peer discussion, and of course a lot of that can happen on Facebook and on Twitter. Um, so I would ask what, what tools are, are they using? You know, it, it could be a perfectly reasonable thing to, to dial back on that. Um, I will say that uh, the university students that I teach, I make very forums available for them. There's a, a forum called Discourse that's kind of trying to bring the forum into the 21st century. There are a lot of advantages of forums over the way Facebook group discussions happen. But time and again, the students say, can't we move this to a Facebook group? Because that's where they live. Um, and quite often, many of them say, I didn't realize that you could have serious discussions in Facebook groups. So I think it's useful to use Facebook, if you understand why you're using it, uh, to have classroom discussions that, that carry on a culture of conversation beyond the, the classroom after class between classes for the, the students to form and maintain a community and pursue questions together. If you don't do that, why make it available? Uh, and again with Twitter, people use uh, Twitter, one use of Twitter that, that I have uh, learned about that I would like to adopt is uh, divide the class into volunteers who want to have a, a classroom out loud discussion and, and those who want to have a parallel discussion on Twitter. You make a, a, an inner circle of chairs in which the, the discussants have a conversation and then the outer circle of chairs 
comment on that conversation, they supplement that conversation, they add links to that conversation, they add questions about the out loud conversation, and then you appoint a moderator who will raise questions from the Twitter stream for the out loud people to discuss. So, in my opinion, that's a really interesting experiment to use Twitter for. So, uh, you know, I think it's important to know why you are using a tool and what the, the context is, and to know why you are blocking the tool and, and, and what the context for that is. I, I do think if your objective is for young people to, to learn how to make good choices, you're not really strengthening their ability to do so if you simply remove the, the ability to make those choices. Austin, you want to jump in? Yeah, I, I was reading earlier about how you created Brainstorms, which is like a, a web conferencing community. Um, and to what it seems like to me, that was kind of one of the first of its kind. Do you think that it kind of paved the way for other web conferencing communities to like go forward? Well, you know, it's, it's kind of like the... Uh, the dark matter uh, of the West. Nobody really knows how many of these, um, you know, private groups with many-to-many -many discussions. Maybe they're happening on Facebook. Maybe they're happening with web conferencing. Maybe they're happening in the ancient Usenet. How many of those still continue? Um, it's all of the attention really is on Facebook and Twitter and, and Tumblr and, and WordPress. But a lot of this still goes on. I think what has changed is that at the beginning, people who shared a particular interest in science or art or, or cats or dogs would find a place online where people were having those discussions and they would join those discussions and they would form relationships and those relationships would grow into communities around that subject matter. Um, now I think, you know, it's, it's oriented around your social network. So in, in Facebook, it's, it's your friends. Um, in Tumblr, people have different subjects and people uh, congregate about that. Um, Brainstorms is still alive. It's, it's a little long in the tooth. It's like uh, 16 years old now. So, you know, any group of people who are going to communicate on a regular basis over 16 years, uh, those conversations age if you don't have a fresh flow of, of new people. Um, I'm hoping that discourse will um, kind of reawaken the people's appetite for those kinds of, of group forming conversations in that uh, Good, good forms enable many people to have many conversations over a length of time. And Facebook doesn't enable you to have that. And comment threads on, on blogs don't enable you to have that. But, uh, but Brainstorms was a, a place where when people were sick, other people organized to take care of them. Brainstorms was a place where we form relationships so that we had uh, parties where people would come in from Europe and all over America to San Francisco or Memphis or Amsterdam to have meetups of 15 or 20 or, or 30 people. When people had uh, financial problems, we passed the hat and raised money for them. I think the last time I checked, we had probably distributed about twenty or $30,000. So I... I I think you, you need to understand that every conversational group does not need to become that kind of tight-knit community where people care about each other, but I think it's important that that continue to exist. It certainly does exist among patients and caregivers with diseases. There's an entire world of cancer blogs um, in which the, the comment threads are support systems. There are patient communities. Um, so, I, I'd like to see it continue to exist, uh, but I think Facebook has kind of degraded the art of forum conversation because Facebook conversation groups 
don't really index the, the, the conversation threads well. It's, uh, the latest one that was posted to is at the top, and that's about it. Okay. Uh, mine kind of relates to the student usage of Facebook and Twitter. Uh, back in the 80s, you were even worried about how personal computers could be more harmful or helpful. Do you feel with how tech savvy we've gotten and how handheld and readily available it is, 30 years later, do you still feel it is more harmful or helpful to have that social media usage right there? You know, that big question is awfully hard to parse without thinking about the, the circumstances. Certainly, there are people for whom an obsession with hanging out online or playing games online has, has, has been harmful. I think we all agree, certainly I have this conversation with my students who all agree, it's annoying when you are talking to someone and they are checking their phone. Um, maybe in a few years that will just be considered normal. But, uh, or you go to dinner and you have conversations with friends and there's a certain point in dinner where people will take out their phones and then everyone will take out their phones. But conversations with my students is that they indicate that they, they don't particularly like that. So, so clearly we are beginning to see some of the problems and of course there's, there's spam and, and fraud and, um, and a lot of problems with, with criminal activity online. But, you know, if you are uh, physically disabled or you live in a high crime neighborhood or you have a disease um, or you're just a lonely person, that connection can be a lifeline. So, again, I think the context is really important. Um, who are you talking about and who are you leaving out? Uh, when you're talking about places where there is... Uh, political oppression and censorship. Sometimes uh, Facebook and Twitter and other online media are the, the way that, that people can organize uh, political activities. Um, there are some good questions to ask about that. We've seen successful revolutions in places like Egypt We've seen the beginnings of that in places like Brazil. We're seeing ongoing um, social media organs in Turkey. In Egypt in particular, the question is, can a, a revolution turn into a movement? We've seen that most revolutions are hijacked. Uh, people who had been afraid to demonstrate for decades went out on the streets and they overthrew a dictatorship. But that was not enough or has not been enough to prevent another dictatorship from arising. So we're really at a time when people are, are trying to figure out how to make these tools work to their benefit. Um, the, answer, the answer to that question, I think, has not really come out yet. I think it, a lot of it depends on what we learn and what, what people do. But, but certainly, I think... Um, we need to have discussions among ourselves about norms in our social group, about our, about distraction, about, uh, boy, you know, walking around the Stanford campus, you have to be very careful not to be run over by someone on their bicycle looking at their phone. Um, <laughs> we need to develop some kinds of, of norms among ourselves about those things. And, you know, I would think if you, if you want to ask a question about... Um, people slightly younger than you, about teenagers. Um, Dana Boyd's new book, It's Complicated, is the title, is a really great place to look to see some real evidence-based answers to those questions about young people. And, for example, um, young people hang out online a, a lot. Um, Boyd points out that this has a great deal to do with the overscheduled lives and the, the the loss of places to hang out in public that young people have. They would like to hang out more face to face, but that's less possible than it used to be. You know, in the uh, 
in the old movies, they used to go to the, uh, the soda fountain, and then, oh, I don't know, a decade or two ago, it was the mall. Um, Those places are discouraged now. They've become privatized. Uh, bands of teenagers are discouraged there. Their, their parents are afraid they're going to get in trouble. Um, they've got dance lessons. Um, there's just a, a lot that prevents teenagers from communicating with their peers the way they used to. And now they have these media for communicating with their peers. And there's a lot of fears that older people are projecting uh, on that communication. Could we do one more question? Um, at this point, well, maybe not at this point, but maybe more prematurely, do you think Facebook and Twitter would still be as successful as they are if you had to pay to be members or to have an account? Even Pinterest and Instagram, those very popular ones right now. No. Uh, you know, I think any, any barrier, uh, and cost is a, a big one, but a complicated user interface is a, another one is going to reduce the, the number of people who use it regularly. And the, the ones that you're talking about, Twitter and Facebook, they're in big numbers games. Um, they want to have billions of users. I do think, uh, you know, I, I'm sure you've heard that um, if you're not paying for the product, you're the product. That, in fact, the, the, the free services we get are collecting information about us, which they are selling to people who want to sell us things. That's a complicated subject that we probably don't have time to get into. I think that there's pros and cons to it. It's part of a, a, an erosion of privacy that, that has changed our lives. But it's also somewhat benign in that the people want to sell us things, uh, not so much control our lives. I do think what's really interesting is the freemium model, where um, basic services are available for free. So Flickr has sort of been supplanted by Instagram um, for photographers, but a lot of people still use it. You can use Flickr for free. If you want to have extra high quality photographs, you want to have uh, more than a, a certain limit of photographs, on, you, you pay 20 bucks a year. Same thing with things like like Dropbox or, or Evernote. You can use it to a certain degree for free, and then if you want fancy features, you pay for it. I think that, that model is a lot more promising. Well, Flickr just revamped because there, so many people were upset with the changes that now you get a terabyte free on Flickr, and you pay after the terabyte. Boy, a terabyte was uh, all of the memory in the world not that long ago. <laughs> and now, um, I, I, I have a, a um, multiple gigabyte USB key that I have to be very careful where I put it because it's so small that I can lose it. And I think that'll, that will be true of the terabyte soon, um, of course. And, and I think that has big, big implications uh, for people. So, um, you know, I appreciate that uh, you really did your homework uh, and you asked really thoughtful questions. And personally, I think that we are in a golden era. If you know how to ask the right questions and you know how to check whether the answers you get are, are accurate or not, you can learn anything um, at any time, anywhere. That has not always been true. School has its place. But until very recently, school had a monopoly on learning things. Nowadays, if, if, if you ask a 14-year-old, um, how do you make a, a, a model airplane or how do you configure a Linux server, they're going to go to YouTube and find another 14-year-old who's going to tell you how to do it. So I'm, as I said, I'm not an optimist, but I'm very hopeful. Uh, hope is a choice. And I think you have tremendous opportunities. The web is not closed down. It's not completely owned. Um, it's not completely undemocratic. There are forces to enclose it. There are some real problems. But you have, you have the opportunity to, you, to, to shape these tools to your uses in the future. So um, go do it. Don't let anybody tell you that 
um, you have no chance of doing it. Tim Berners-Lee um, gave the web away uh, and had to talk people into creating um, websites. Google and, and Yahoo were created in dormitory rooms. They didn't have to ask anybody's permission to, to do it. So go out and do it. Howard, this has been fabulous. Thank you so much for doing this today. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.